Now, and my topic is salvation, and I couldn't have picked one better if I just picked it myself. But anyway, I am so blessed and so honored to have this opportunity to speak to you tonight concerning what the Bible says about salvation. There are so many things that we can talk about. And if I can work this, that's the corner. There we go. Well, there it was. There it is. Before I get right into the meat of talking about what the Bible says about salvation, there are some things that I felt really compelled to bring forward, to let, to, to talk to you about, and here it goes. Philippians 3 and verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us get it, walk by the same rule, let us judgment. 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves, get it, teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Friends, you can pick any variety of any religious group out there. And you can ask them this question, what must I do to be saved? And I assure you, you're most likely going to get different answers from the different groups. There's not varying answers to that question in God's book. There never was and there never will be. God's answer is the same answer to everyone. What God's book says to you, friends, it says to me, it doesn't tell me to do one thing to be saved and tell somebody else to do another thing to be saved. And it's all because different groups, different people have different answers because they have changed God's answers because of their beliefs, because of their doctrines. Understand this. Somewhere back in time, somebody misunderstood something. Somewhere back in time, somebody misinterpreted something. Somebody misapplied something. Somebody misused. Somebody twisted the scriptures. They took it out of context to fit what they believed. So there you have it. The formation of hundreds and thousands of different religious organizations that are teaching that are believing, that are practicing, that are obeying something different from the other, and at the same time, they are saying they're getting their doctrine from God's Word. Here's a truth. You can bank on it. They can all be wrong, friends, but there is no way under heaven they can all be right, simply because they differ in what they teach, what they believe, what they obey, and what they practice. We can ask that question. Is this from heaven or is it from men? Well, we know the answer. God wouldn't do that to us. Such is not from heaven. Such is due to the desires of men. It's due to misunderstanding. It's due to misinterpretation. And it's been going on. It continues today. Being wrong when it comes to spiritual things is a serious matter. God wants us to be right. But man has changed it up. And they will continue to change it up. And what's sad is they're pleased with that. They're pleased with the fact that you can choose the church of your choice. They're pleased with the fact that you can have it your way. You can choose a church that suits you. Choose a doctrine that suits you. Friends, that's not from heaven. That's from men. 
If Satan could do something to muddy the waters just a little bit regarding salvation, interfere with God's plan of redemption just a little bit, if he could cause religious-minded people to be pitted against one another, opposed to one another, what might he do? You see what he has done. Might he suggest obedience is not required? Might he change God's requirements for salvation just ever so little? Might he add something to God's word? Might he take something away from it? Yet, all the while, having some semblance of truth, some semblance of righteousness. Who's behind turning God's plan of salvation upside down if it's not Satan and his ministers? That's something that should concern us. Well-intended, sincere men who have followed their own wisdom, traditions, and doctrines, People are following error everywhere. They're following teachings of men. They're following the likes and dislikes of men. And they seem to like what they're doing. All of this and more has caused havoc. Havoc in the Christian religion. It has caused division. It's causing people to even distrust dismiss religion altogether and it's causing people to be lost. This is what we face and this is why I am so honored to have this opportunity for it's so very important for us to know exactly, no questions, exactly what the Bible says about salvation. And we're going to try to look at three points. The why the how and the when of salvation. The why. Why do we need it? Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins has hidden His face from you. So He will not hear. Iniquities, sins. Sin entered through Adam, according to Romans 5 at verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man was totally lost, separated from God, and it took God's love. It took God's mercy. It took God's grace to address man's sin problem. Jeremiah 10, and verse 23. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walked to direct his own steps. Man could not devise a way to be reconciled to God. Man could not save himself from it. His iniquities, the why, lost. Man was lost. And for God so loved, God so loved the world. He loved mankind. He loved His creation. Jesus was ordained to be the Savior of the world because of the great love and the great mercy of Jesus Christ. The Bible describes two types of people in the world. The lost and the saved. And there is a dividing line between those two groups. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 tells us most people are going to be on the lost side of that line. We want to look at some things that will help us understand how to get from one side to the other. The dividing line between the lost and the saved, friends, is remission of sins, it's forgiveness, it's pardon, it's salvation. Which side of the line do you believe that you're on today? Now I want to talk about the how. 
the how did salvation come? 1 Peter 1, 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in his last times for you. Friends, before the world was, the word spoken of in 1 John, that word, he was ordained to be the Savior of the world, that he would come in the flesh. John 1, verses 1 and 2, and verses 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John three sixteen. For God so loved, a great love, so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, have everlasting life. How did salvation come? Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do in, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh. The how of salvation. Hebrews 9, beginning at verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the age, he has appeared to put away sin, get it, by the sacrifice of himself. And as it as appointed for man to die once, and after this the judgment, get it. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. The how? To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. More of the how. Romans 3, beginning at verses 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, get it by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. More of the how. Romans 5 beginning at verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. More of the how. Ephesians 1 beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which he made us adopted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. More. Romans 5, verses 14 and 15. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of God, one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Salvation came through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, his offering of himself as the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of of the world. 
by the grace of Almighty God. Acts 4.12 Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now the when. We've looked at the why, the how, and now we want to look at the when of salvation. Hebrews 5, yeah, Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became, get it, the author of eternal salvation and get it to all who obey him. He wrote the book on salvation to all who obey him. 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning at verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and get it in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The when of salvation we see in those two verses is that obedience, is it not? Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 and verses 21. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And few, and there are few who find it. And at verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Romans 1 at verse 5 and then 16 at verse 25 and 26. Through him we have received grace and apostleship and get it for obedience to the faith. Among all nations for his name. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, and get it, for obedience to the faith. Hebrews 3, verses 16 and following. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not those who sinned, those whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Well, which is it, Lord? Is it because they did not obey or is it because of unbelief? We need to make a note right here. God's word tells us plainly that disobedience equals unbelief. If unbelief and disobedience are equal, then belief and obedience are equal. Belief obeys. Unbelief disobeys. To refuse obedience is to be an unbeliever. When one obeys, that proves their belief. The Bible calls that faith. There is no such thing as unbelieving faith in God's Word. There's no such thing as Disobedient faith in God's Word. Bible faith is obedient faith. It has always been obedient faith and will continue to be obedient faith. 
Just consider Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, each one mentioned in that chapter did something. They believed and that belief, that faith, caused them to act obedience. What God requires we must do. Else we are disobedient. Else we are unbelievers. Friends, obedience to God is a must. A must if we're going to receive God's salvation. Hebrews 11 at verse 6. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must, must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And how many times have we heard those that hang on that verse and say, see there, see? It just says believe and I've got eternal life. Friends, what does belief do? They say nothing. Belief obeys. John 8, 24. Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Mental assent only? Or is there something God would have man to do? Romans 10. Verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've got his message. We can have faith because it comes from God's word. Friends, it's not belief alone. It's not faith alone. James. And James 2 at verse 24 tells us it is not by faith only. God requires something of you and me. God requires belief, faith. The question is, what does belief do? We'll see what belief does. Does belief obey or disobey? Every time we see it in the Bible, it's obedience. It's, it's obeying. It's doing what God said do. So that's only part of it. Belief. In Luke 13 at verse 3, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Second Peter 3 at verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We must obey. We must believe that He is. We must believe that God raised Him from the dead. We must repent. We must turn from selfishness toward God. God requires repentance. It's required. Consider Matthew 10 at verse 32. Wherefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Acts 8 at verse 37. Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. He had just got through preaching Jesus to this Ethiopian. And he said, See, here's what. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then he gave that confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have Jesus' command to confess him. And then we also have an example here of that very thing happening. Friends, confessing Jesus before men is required. There's no way to eliminate what God has bound and be right with him. But there's more. What
brought about this salvation. In Acts chapter 2, we've got Peter preaching the first gospel sermon. And he says, This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both, both Lord and Christ. And at that, the multitude cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Did Peter get it right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Those words coming out of his mouth were not his own. And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and get it, not because of, but for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But there's more. Mark 16, 16. Jesus' words here, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Oh, wait a minute now. It doesn't say, but if he is baptized not, doesn't have to say that. For if one does not believe, baptism is moot. It would not matter if you got somebody under the water. If they don't believe, that's not baptism. He who believes and is. That and is. It's just like repenting and being baptized. That conjunction that puts those together, the repenting and the baptism, and the believing in the baptism. Man can't separate what God has put together. God chose these words. Men have been messing with God's words for a long time. We need to be aware of that. But there's more. There's more of the when the salvation occurred. 1 Peter 3 at verse 21. There is also an antitype, which now, get this, saves us. Baptism. It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. How do I have a good conscience toward God if I'm still in my sins? I can't. But at baptism, baptism, when those sins are removed, now I can have a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism does also now save us. What do they do with that verse? They ignore it. Talk around it. But there's more of the win of salvation. Acts 22 at verse 16. Here, we've got Saul of Tarsus. He's been on his way to Damascus. The Lord appears to him. He's blinded. He says, Lord, what must I do? He tells him to go into the city and it will be told him what he must do. Three days. Three days he's in prayer. And if he's saved at that point, friends, Jesus didn't know it. For Jesus sent Ananias to him to tell him what to do. If he's saved at that point, Ananias doesn't know it either. What does Ananias tell him when he arrives? And now, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Here we go. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of of the Lord. When was Saul of Tarsus saved? When his sins were washed away. He was immersed in water. And it's the same command from the day of Pentecost and it's still in force today. And men have been messing with it all these years and telling us Oh, baptism is not necessary for salvation. And people believe it. And people believe that they are saved at the point of faith. They are saved at the point of asking the Lord Jesus to come in their heart and be Lord of their life. Friends, find that in God's Word. People have put out rewards for man to come to them 
with that verse. The reward's never been paid. The verse is not there. But there's more. The when of salvation. Revelation 1 at verse 5. To him who loved us and get and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The washing occurs at baptism. And understand, understand, there is no such thing as dry cleaning in God's Word. No such thing. Never was and never will be. Friends, belief is required. Repentance is required. Confession is required. And hear it. Baptism for the remission of sins is required. Here. Ephesians. Let me get over. I skipped. This is some of the things that we are talking about. And this slide is available if anyone would like to have a copy of it. Ephesians 1 at verse 7. Get this. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Consider Romans 8 at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Lord. 2 Timothy 2 at verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation, get it, salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal joy. Friends, being in Christ Jesus is an absolute necessity for salvation. A necessity. No way around it. But Satan would just muddy the waters just a little bit. He would just have us think that there's another way. How did he fool Eve? He just added one word. Three letters. And for us. Oh, that does not, does not have to be baptized. Do we see what's happened? Do we see the tragedy of it? And the greatest tragedy is people are going to their grave believing they are in a right relationship with God when they have not, have not obeyed the gospel according to the scriptures. And unfortunately, they're going to have the vengeance of God upon them. We have a responsibility for, before one another, before Almighty God, before this community, and any and every opportunity that we can to tell the truth, to speak the truth. When did Jesus Christ cower from the truth? When did Peter cower from the truth? When did any of the apostles? When did Paul cower from the truth? They all spoke and they spoke boldly. And we should speak boldly. With love. With love in our heart. Because maybe we were one of those at some point in our past. We needed to hear the truth. So we have compassion on those have not obeyed the gospel. Being in Christ is absolutely necessary. Romans 1 verse 16 For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation. The power of God to salvation. This gospel for everyone that believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. This gospel this power. What is it? 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 beginning. And Paul is telling these Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. I preached to you this gospel which he preached, which you also received. They believed it. They received it. In which you stand. They were standing in that belief, in that truth. By which you also get this, were saved by that gospel. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain, and here it is, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Here we go. This is He's explaining this gospel. For Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Friends, obedience to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is required. That's obedience to the gospel. And the ones that do not obey that gospel is going to have the vengeance of God upon them and destruction come upon them. In Romans 5 at verse 9, much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Do we get it? Justified by his blood. Having the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us is required. Was his blood shed in his death? Yes. Then how do we contact his death where his blood was shed? God tells us. This is not hard to understand. Romans 6 beginning at verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were, get this, baptized into Christ. We've got to be in Christ to be saved. That's where salvation is located. Baptized, we're baptized. Baptized. Immersed in water. Into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism. Into death. That's Christ's death. That just as Christ was also raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together. Words to hang on to. For if we have been united together. When did that uniting together occur? Yeah. Buried with him in baptism. That's when the new life. When they were raised from, those water, from that watery grave. United together in the likeness of it, that certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. What a glorious day that will be. But there's more. Colossians 2, beginning at verse 11. In Him, there's more of that in Christ, in Him, you are also, get this, circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. It's a spiritual circumcision. It's not of the flesh. And get it. What does that mean, Lord? Buried with Him in baptism. In which you were also raised with Him. And get this, through faith in the working of God. The forgiveness of sins, the removal of sins, the removal of sins of the flesh. That's a working of God. When does it occur? Before or after baptism, according to this passage. Through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. 1 Corinthians 6 at verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the Spirit of our God. That's God's order of business. Washed. Sanctified. Justified. And many have turned it around backwards. And preaching it to people who have believed it. And it's sad. 
The washing equals cleansing. It equals pardon, my friends. It equals being forgiven. It equals saved. Someone said, well, wait a minute. You've been talking about quoting all these scriptures. You left out Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. No, I didn't. It's just this is the place to talk about. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Friends, grace is God part, God's part. Faith is man's part. Again, does faith obey or does faith disobey? Faith is described in the Bible as always obeying. And that's the requirement for us. God's grace has done many, many things to bring salvation to this world. God's grace even teaches us. God's grace instructs us. Gives us things to follow. Titus 2 verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings, here it is, brings salvation has appeared to all men. What does that grace do, Lord? Teaching us that denying ungodliness, turning from the world, worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Straighten up your life. God's book teaches us what we must do. Now, how can anyone deny that man's salvation is dependent, is not dependent upon all that God has said on the subject? There's much. And said on the subject. And the only way that we would not understand it is if someone else is telling us that scripture does not mean what it says. Friends, this is a picture. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We read those passages in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died on the cross, he was buried. And he was resurrected from the dead on the third day. Obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which is a must. Unless we want to have the vengeance of almighty God upon us. We must obey that gospel. And that gospel is explained in Romans 6. 3 through 5. And I just explained Colossians 2. That circumcision made without hands. That removal of the filth. That removal of sin, the body of sin, in baptism. And here we have an individual, you for instance, buried in water, raised to walk in the newness of life. Friends, this is being born of the water and of the Spirit. God's salvation is not hard to understand. But men have done much to muddy the water. And Satan is so glad about that. But there's no one. But we've run out of time. Salvation occurs. The when of it is upon obedience. Upon obedience to doing what God said, how he said do it, and for the reason he gave. And anything shy of that is not salvation according to God's word. And one last thing. The rift comes from opponents at the when salvation occurs. You have heard what the Bible says about salvation. I know there's many scriptures and quote. It's hard to keep up with all of that. Bible script. The question is, will you receive it? Will you receive God's salvation? Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I believe that was the second thing.
Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone here. This is uh, the first night of our summer series. And uh, if you didn't know the plan of salvation and what the Bible says about it, and you were in the auditorium class, then you certainly know what the Bible says about the plan of salvation now. sure are thankful for Brother Ken and his diligence in the scripture and giving us that good lesson. We have several folks on our prayer list and uh, I'm going to just note uh, some of the, the more recent ones and the updates and that we had from Sunday. We want to remember our uh, Garvin Skates as he's recovering from surgery. Also, Randall Webb recovered from surgery. This is David's brother-in-law. He made it through surgery fine. Probably be at Memorial Hospital for about a week. And uh, got his breathing tube out and is uh, talking to his wife and just, just doing good. So we're glad to hear that. Also, an update on Faye's sister, Gwen Richelson. She also had surgery and uh, that surgery went well and she was able to go home. And she is recovering there, so that's good. Also, Ken and Faye's new grandbaby is home and doing well, too. And so we're happy to hear that as well. We also mentioned uh, Caden Hackney, an infant that was having issues, uh, not, not thriving. Uh, Caden was able to go home, but is still on the feeding tube. So please continue your prayers for Caden Hackney uh, and the parents, Austin and Leah. We also added the prayer list on Sunday, Bill Brown. I think I said that wrong on Sunday. I think I said Graham, but uh, I misunderstood. It's Bill Brown, and this is Ralph and Nancy Mann's uh, daughter-in-law's dad. He has a tumor next to his brain and uh, having some serious issues with that, so please keep Bill Brown in your prayers. Lastly, added to the prayer list tonight, please keep the family of Bobby Hayes in your prayers. Bobby is a longtime member down at Pleasant Grove and served as an elder there, and uh, he passed away. Uh, his visitation is going to be tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and the funeral will follow at 2 o'clock tomorrow, and that will be at Earl Rainwater Funeral Home down in Somerville. would like to remind everyone that there is a sign-up sheet posted on the bulletin board. 
to sign up for youth activities. That goes all the way through December. So if you haven't signed up to host one of those yet, uh, make sure that you do. Uh, the McClure's have signed up for June, and that activity is going to be on June 19th. And it's going to be here at the building following evening worship. And uh, the McClure's are going to bring smoked pork tenderloin. You can just stop right there. That's enough for me to come. I don't know about y'all. Uh, but they're going to bring that, and there's going to be a sign-up sheet. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet already posted on the bulletin board for other items needed uh, to come as well. So check that out and make sure you sign up to bring something to go that good smoke pork that I'm already looking forward to. Also, Maywood Christian Camp will be July 17th through the 23rd. We'll be leaving on Saturday the 16th. If you would like to make a donation to help a child go to this camp, you can do that. Just make sure that you write for Maywood Christian Camp in the in the fourth section of that check. Make it out to the church in space. Fellowship meal will be June 26th, following morning worship with our 2 p.m. service following that. July 2nd will be our men's breakfast. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for that as well. Brian Pettyjohn is going to be our speaker. And he's going to speak on the courage of Abraham. So I'm sure that will be a treat. Also a reminder, if you took the uh, first aid classes, your CPR card should have been emailed to you. If you can take those and make sure that you get those forwarded to Charlotte Ann to put in the file here at the building, then uh, that'll make sure that we've got everything lined up the way that we should. And if you didn't get those yet, make sure you let Diane know, and uh, she will... She will take care of making sure that those do get sent out to you. Uh, lastly, the uh, the Lafayette Freedom Festival is going to be the weekend of July 4th, and uh, that Freedom Festival is going to be Friday, July 1st, and we plan on to have the congregation having a presence there and going to hand out water. There's a sign-up sheet in the back to sign up to make sure that uh, we have people there to help with that. So make sure that you check that and sign up. And just to just to show you that we have all these sign up sheets, I've got a copy of every one of them. There's the red, white, and blue one for the Freedom Festival. So we want to make sure that we've got people signed up for the five to seven slot, the seven to nine slot, and the nine to eleven slot. So depending on what time you want to go to bed or don't go to bed, if you're late, if you're late, you can sign up for the later one. And uh, if you're uh, go to bed early, you can sign up for one of the early ones. That's all the announcements I have at this time. Uh, at the proper time, Brother Don Shield is going to lead us in a closing prayer, and we'll turn the song service over to Jackson. The invitation song tonight will be number 655. The song before the lesson will be number 48. First and last verses are number 48. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. This story of a preacher who set an old rusty birdcage 
up on the pulpit one day and then told the congregation how he got it. He was out on the street one day and saw this street urchin who had this cage full of wild birds in his possession. The preacher asked the young man what he was going to do with the birds, and the boy answered, Oh, mister, I'm going to play with them. And the preacher then asked, Well, what are you going to do when you get tired of playing with them? And the boy said, Well, I'm going to kill them. So the preacher asked, How much will you take for them? And the boy gave what he thought was an exorbitant answer. $20. To the boy's surprise, the preacher pulled out a $20 bill, handed it to the boy, and took the cage of birds. When the boy was out of sight, the preacher opened the door to the cage and let the birds go. Then the preacher, he imagined a conversation between Satan and Jesus. Satan had everyone in the world in his cage. And the Lord asked Satan, What are you going to do with them folks? Satan answered, Well, I'm going to teach them how to hate one another. I'm going to teach them how to hurt one another. I'm going to give them all kinds of troubles. I'm going to give them all kinds of problems. I'm going to teach them to do evil. Then the Lord asked, well, when you get through playing with them, Satan, what are you going to do with them? And Satan says, Well, they will be consigned to a devil's hell for all eternity. Jesus asked, What do you want for them? And Satan said, I want you. I want your life, and I want all your blood. Peter says Jesus paid that price. And he opened the door to that cage so we could go free. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold and silver, or silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. What's hard to understand is why some people stay in the cage. The door is open. What an exorbitant price was paid to open that door, but it's open because Jesus Christ has paid the price and He opened that door. He gave His life in His precious blood that you and I could go through. We have given in detail what the Bible says about salvation tonight. And if there is anyone who has not obeyed that gospel, You can expect God's vengeance to be upon you. But it's not His will that you not obey. God wishes that all come to repentance. If you have not done that, tonight is the night where you have today. Take advantage of it while you have today. And if there is something that has caused you to stumble and you're out of step, with God's will. What an opportunity it is. That we can pray with and for you. That you can correct those things in your life. Whatever it is. Won't you come right now. As we stand. And as we sing. <laughs>
And I believe we can all say that it has been a blessing to be here tonight. I want to thank Brother Ken for a great Bible class starting off our summer series and teaching us about what the Bible has to say about salvation. And again, a, a wonderful devotion tonight. Appreciate Brother Jackson for leading us in those songs. And for every Bible class teacher who put forth the effort in coming out tonight in teaching class, and of course, a class is impossible to teach without students. And so we're very thankful for the presence of all who chose to come out and be a part of this Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, it, because of the great work of everyone here that we were able to have a very successful night. I want to remind you to be back Sunday morning at 10 a.m. as we will have Bible study, 11 a.m. as we will have morning worship, and then 5 p.m. that we will have evening worship. If there's nothing else, we will be dismissed in prayer at this time. Together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we're so thankful for this evening that you've given us and we could come out and hear another great portion of your word. Thank Brother Ken for the great preparation he made and the, the wonderful scriptures on salvation. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that Christ made. Father, as we're about to depart, we're mindful of those who've been mentioned as sick, especially uh, those uh, in the hospitals. Randall Webb, we pray that heart surgery go great with him. He'll recover greatly. And you bring Brother Garvin back to us too, that he'll heal up just fine. We're mindful of Bill Brown and Gwen. We pray, Father, that you will help them also. Their bodies might continue to be stronger. Father, uh, Father, also help our brother David Payton make his body stronger with every day that passes. Be with those who have uh, lost loved ones just recently, the Gilly family and also Sylvia's family. And also Bobby Hayes that's passed away down south of us here. Pray that you'll help them. Father, help us in all that we do, and as we depart, uh, go with us and bring us back to the next pointed hour. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>